Good evening, everyone. I'm Donna Duncan, a member of Sunnybrook's Board of Directors, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual speaker series this evening. Tonight, we turn our focus to a topic that will be important to all of us during the course of our lives, our relationship with our pharmacy team. Our pharmacists are the highly trained experts you interact with when receiving a prescription, and they are an essential part of any healthcare team. Pharmacists have extensive knowledge of hundreds of medications. In addition to dispensing and advising on medications, they provide a host of other essential services to patients every day. As our population continues to age, and so many more people are taking multiple medications and dealing with a variety of health ailments, our pharmacist's expertise is more important than ever. We are very fortunate to have an expert in the field moderating tonight's discussion. Karen Lamb is the manager of Sunnybrook's Ambulatory Patient Pharmacy. If you've ever been there, you know it's an extremely busy place offering private patient counseling, medication delivery, compounding of specialized products, and many, many other services. Karen and her team are involved in multiple projects to improve environmental sustainability, including transferring to a paperless workflow system, as well as decreasing single-use ice packs. Karen's team at the Outpatient Pharmacy ensures patients receive the care they need. She and her team engage patients in their care, check in on patient adherence and adverse drug events, and also provide vaccinations. And that's just a bit about what Karen does. So as you can see, we are in very good hands having Karen moderate this evening's event. So with that, welcome everybody. We're delighted to have you join us this evening. And Karen, I'll pass things over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. And good evening to all of you who are joining us remotely this evening. Tonight, our lecture is called Keeping Your Pharmacy Team in the Know. We have Sarah, Sarah Wong, one of our students at the Ambulatory Patient Pharmacy, and she's going to get us started with a discussion about vaccinations and the role of your pharmacy team. Harjit Bola will then follow that with a presentation on understanding compounding, something that some of you may not have heard of before. And finally, Jennifer Antoon, We'll talk about the importance of communicating with your pharmacy team. We'll also set aside some time at the end of the evening for you to ask our panelists some questions. I want to thank everyone who has already submitted a question online. And please feel free to send your questions while the presentations are happening throughout the evening on the web page. We may not be able to get to all the questions tonight, but we'll do our very best to answer them. All right, so let us begin the lectures. I'd like to first introduce Sarah Wong. She is a pharmacy student from Waterloo and currently completing her co-op rotation at the pharmacy in M1. We're very glad that she's here. To tell us more about the role of your pharmacy team and your pharmacy when it comes to vaccination. Without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to Sarah. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Um, I'll share my screen first. All right, can, is my screen viewable right now? Okay, great. So yes, thank you, Karen, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be here tonight and discuss a really important topic and that is uh, vaccinations and the role of your pharmacist in vaccinations. So in terms of, objectives, I wanted to first discuss some general information about vaccines. Uh, what are vaccines? How do vaccines work? A brief history and the importance of vaccines. Uh, next, I'll discuss the scope of practice of pharmacists in vaccinations, uh, the role of pharmacists as educators when it comes to educating the public about vaccine schedules, side effects, uh, storage and handling, and answering concerns dealing with vaccine hesitancy. And then I'll summarize the presentation with some key takeaways. So first, what are vaccines? So a vaccine is a biological substance uh, that's designed to protect humans from infections or diseases. It uses your body's natural defense system to build resistance and to produce a stronger immune system. 
Vaccines are a preventable measure. So different than medications are used to treat or cure disease, uh, vaccines are made to prevent humans from becoming sick in the first place. Uh, some terms you may hear often um, are vaccination and immunization. So I want to include these definitions as well. Vaccination is the action of receiving a vaccine or introducing a vaccine into the body. Uh, whereas immunization means the process of becoming protected against a disease. And commonly, vaccination and immunization are used interchangeably. A person that does not have immunity would be deemed susceptible, meaning that individual has a risk of becoming infected by a disease. So vaccines are delivered most commonly by needle, but they can also be taken by mouth or inhalation through the nose. And there are many forms of vaccines, but most commonly a vaccine is made with a weakened or destroyed form of the disease bacteria. When injected, your body will naturally produce antibodies to fight against the particular invading bacteria. And so these antibodies will remain in your body. And if you're then exposed to the germ in the future, your immune system can quickly destroy it before you become unwell. So again, our immune systems are designed to remember. Once exposed to uh, one or more doses of vaccine, and you, we typically remain protected against the disease. So rather than treating a disease after it occurs, vaccines prevent us in the first instance from getting sick. So the story of the first vaccine uh, created was based on one of the most severe viral diseases known to mankind called smallpox. Uh, smallpox was a very deadly disease and plagued human populations for thousands of years. It wasn't until uh, 1796, a physician named Edward Jenner uh, noticed that milkmaids who contracted the mild cowpox disease uh, were immune to smallpox. Uh, Jenner speculated that the germ responsible for cowpox was similar enough to the smallpox germ to train the immune system to defeat both diseases. Uh, he was correct, and with this knowledge, he created the first vaccine against smallpox. And over the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, by Im implementing the smallpox uh, vaccine, it led to its complete eradication in 1980. And nearly a century, a century after Edward Jenner, we have a French chemist named Louis Pasteur who made the next big impact on human disease by developing an effective vaccine against rabies. He treated a nine-year-old human uh, victim who was bit by a dog. And moving into the middle of the 20th century, uh, this was a very active time for vaccine research and development. And so methods for growing viruses in the laboratory uh, led to rapid discoveries and innovations, uh, including the creation of vaccines for polio. And this was also a time where research researchers were target other common childhood diseases, such as measles, mumps, and rubella. And these vaccines uh, reduced the disease burden greatly. And now in the present day, we can see the relevance of vaccinations in the, in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The three vaccines by Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson Johnson have been the main forefront of vaccinations protecting humans from corona disease. The pandemic has shown what is possible for vaccine development when there is a true global emergency. And even still, data from trials are continually being evaluated and further studies regarding booster shots or uh, COVID-19 vaccines are held because of the emerging variants that can potentially evade protection uh, from existing vaccines. So vaccines are important for two main reasons. Um, vaccines have greatly reduced and eliminated infectious diseases uh, that once killed and harmed infants, children, and adults. As we recall, the smallpox vaccine led to the complete eradication of smallpox and ended the suffering and deaths of many people from that de deadly disease. Number two, uh, vaccines not only protect yourself, but also protect others by lowering the chances of spreading disease. And so this is especially important uh, when it comes to vulnerable populations, which includes children, adults, and those who are ill. So in the past, pharmacists uh, were restricted in which vaccines they could give to patients. 
Uh, it wasn't until December 2016, pharmacists saw an expansion in their scope of practice. Uh, from only being able to administer the influenza vaccine, uh, they, they were now able to administer an additional 13 vaccines for 13 different diseases. Uh, in December 2020, the Ontario Minister of Health uh, approved pharmacists to give vaccines to children two years and older. Um, but prior to this change, the age restriction was five years and older. And most recently, in March 2021, we see a pivotal expansion of pharmacists' roles uh, by being able to administer COVID-19 vaccines. The pandemic was unique in highlighting the, the value that pharmacists can bring to the healthcare system. By allowing uh, vaccinations at pharmacies, more people were getting vaccinated at a more efficient and effective rates. Uh, the pandemic has shown that pharmacists can relieve the burden on a highly stressed healthcare system. And now the Ontario Pharmacists Association, which is Canada's largest advocacy group on behalf of pharmacist professionals, uh, is continually advocating for the government to increase pharmacist involvement in vaccine campaigns. So not only has the pandemic shown the death of pharmacists' capabilities of delivering immunizations, uh, but also in supporting public immune health. Throughout the pandemic, pharmacists continued to operate and to assist patients while also navigating uh, new responsibilities and the complexities of the pandemic. Because of that, pharmacists are able to see just how assess, sorry, um, patients are able to see how accessible and convenient pharmacies are. So by having access to a broad patient population, pharmacists can act as frontline healthcare providers when it comes to educating patients about vaccine schedules, vaccine side effects, storage and handling, and questions that could be causing vaccine hesitancy. Uh, so a patient may wonder, what are our vaccine schedules and why are they necessary? And to educate the patient on this topic, pharmacists can first talk about routine vaccines versus high-risk vaccines. Uh, routine vaccines are recommended for everyone and depending on their age. But in contrast, high-risk vaccines are for high-risk individuals. For example, most people don't need to get the cholera vaccine, but it is recommended for people ages uh, 18 through 16 years old uh, who are traveling to an area where people are getting cholera. Uh, vaccine, <laughs> vaccine schedules are critical to building our immunity from a young age and are designed to keep us protected. Some vaccines such as influenza vaccines require more than one dose. And this is because each year the virus is changing, uh, rendering their previous uh, vaccine antibodies to be ineffective for finding a new virus. Uh, vaccine schedules can be overwhelming to patients, and this is where pharmacists can step in and remind patients to stay on top of their child's vaccines and their own vaccines to ensure both parties are protected from illness. Uh, side effects of vaccines plays another area where patients can have some concerns. It's important for pharmacists to address these side effects and have those open discussions with patients. Informing patients about the temporary side effects they may feel after or during vaccination will help relieve those anxieties they might be feeling. The tiredness, joint pain, or headache a patient might feel after being vaccinated is their body's natural response being triggered by the vaccine to help build that protection against disease. Another side effect that patients should be educated on is anaphylaxis. Uh, which is a known allergic reaction characterized by itchy, rash, or a swelling face. Um, and this usually occurs shortly after a person receives the vaccine. And vaccine clinics will have a supply of epinephrine available in case a patient has an allergic reaction. A patient may wonder why they are asked to stay 15 to 30 minutes after being vaccinated. And this is to ensure that a pharmacist or a healthcare provider um, is there to monitor and treat those serious side effects. So when storing and handling vaccines, pharmacists can as assist patients by educating on how to best handle and keep vaccine integrity, by encouraging patients to pick up their vaccine on their way to their appointment while min minimizing transportation and handling time. And if that's not possible, to inform patients 
how to safely store their vaccines and how to best transport them to ensure vaccines will be preserved and remain effective. So finally, I wanted to touch on vaccine hesitancy, which is defined as the delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines. And the reasons for vaccine hesitancy are complex, and it's not just because of a knowledge deficit, um, but a lack of confidence in vaccine safety um, and apprehensions about side effects have been recognized as one of the main factors towards vaccine hesitancy. So according to the World Health Organization, vaccine hesitancy is based on the three Cs, confidence, complacency, and convenience. So confidence refers to the lack of trust in the effectiveness and the safety of vaccines. Complacency refers to a low uh, perceived risk of vaccines, um, and therefore it's assumed that vaccines are not needed. And convenience refers to the degree to which the comfort, convenience, and time place all affect the uptake of the vaccine. So this, con this continuum uh, ar uh, ranges from total acceptance to complete refusal. And the concern is that hesitancy can lead to refusal and unvaccinated individuals may emerge as disease outbreaks. And on this slide, I just want to uh, list some questions that are all relevant to vaccine hesitancy. Uh, do vaccines contain toxic or dangerous ingredients? Are there long-term and damaging effects of vaccines? These are all very valid questions that a patient may ask a pharmacist. So despite the fact that vaccines have been considered safe and effective in preventing disease, uh, vaccine hesitancy is still a big challenge today. Uh, even the approvals of the COVID-19 vaccines have, been, have has brought the idea of vaccine hesitancy to the forefront with many express, expressing concerns about safety and efficacy. Healthcare workers, especially those in primary care, remain significant influencers on vaccine decisions. Therefore, it's important for pharmacists to practice those measures to overcome patient vaccine hesitancy. And so when counseling patients about vaccines, Pharmacists can engage uh, with them in conversation and use open-ended questions. They can find out about the patient's concerns and fears about vaccines um, and address safety and efficacy. They can listen to the patient, acknowledge their fears, um, and they can provide patients with information about how vaccines work and how their immune the immune system responds to vaccines to build immunity. By addressing these concerns head on, pharmacists are taking away those barriers to vaccine hesitancy and helping patients make those informed decisions. So overall, pharmacists play a fundamental role in vaccinations. By being the most accessible line of healthcare, uh, pharmacists have the opportunity to apply their knowledge and act as educators and advocators for vaccine support to the public. Vaccination is a patient's choice, but pharmacists are there to increase awareness, discuss those benefits versus the risk, and dispel any common myths associated with vaccines. This is the opportunity that pharmacists can take to discuss vaccinations and help patients make informed decisions. Um, so thank you for listening. That's all for my presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very informative. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce our next presenter, Harjeet Bola. Harjeet is a registered pharmacist technician and she works in the area where there's actually a lot of compounding. And she was the first one I thought of and thank you Harjeet for coming tonight. She's here to tell us a little bit more about compounding and what it is and what you can expect. Over to you Harjeet. Thank you very much, Karen. I'll start with sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see the, uh, see my screen titled Understanding Compounding. Okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Harjeet Bola. As uh, Karen just introduced, I work in pharmacy manufacturing department at Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, so I just wanna give you a quick, a basic understanding of what we do at Sunnybrook in order to take care of our patients to the best of our ability based on their needs. And their needs can come from many, many different areas. 
Um, before we get started, I'd like to take a quick poll today um, while you press your uh, raise my hand button on your screen. I just want to get an idea um, how many of you, if you would just share this information with us, how many of you were ever handed a prescription by your physician saying that you need to go to a specialty pharmacy who can do compounding for this prescription? Um, so if I'll give uh, everyone maybe five, 10 seconds to let us know what they, if, um, if ever you have come across. Yeah, I expect many of you, if not all of you, <laughs> with either what, whether it's for ourselves or our family members, um, we may have had a prescription. So you may, you may have also wondered why that, you know, you would have to wait um, for more, longer than 20 minutes for just a jar of cream. Um, well, that is our topic of discussion today, whether it's just a jar of cream or, you know, a few capsules in a bottle, you wonder why. So I'm just going to start. Uh, with what is compounding. It's a very, very straightforward definition I have for you is that it's a method of preparing customized medication by combining two or more, you know, specific ingredients in a particular strength and, of course, in a particular dosage form, which helps us meet unique patient needs. So depending on what the patient's looking for. So that is what compounding really just basically what it is. But I'm going going to expand a little bit on it. Uh, first, I like to. Um, I'm one of those people who like to know why. Why do we need to do something? Why make it complicated? Well, I have a number of reasons why. Um, why do we bother? A few reasons I have. Just some of the very common ones. It's because a particular medication a patient was on is no longer available. It's been discontinued. Um, some drug strengths that are not commercially available by pharmaceutical companies. So that, those are the strengths that we would manufacture for for our patients. Uh, other medical reasons, um, a particular medication is in a tablet form, but our patient cannot swallow or has difficulty swallowing for whatever um, um, medical condition that they have. So we would uh, uh, make it in a liquid form. A patient is allergic to a particular ingredient that the product is commercially available in. So we would make the compound, but uh, avoiding that ingredient so that the patient doesn't get the allergic reaction. Other manufacturing issues are a shortage of raw materials, so we wouldn't actually make that compound in our pharmacy. Other things, something as simple as there's increased demand and the manufacturer's not able to keep up. So that's another reason why we do that. Uh, what do we compound? Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, what do we compound? We've got, um, we compound anywhere from, oops, sorry, <laughs> creams to capsules, eye drops, um, enemas, suppositories, mouthwashes, you name it, we make it. Um, so it's depending on the patient's needs, we would make a kind of medication. Um, sorry, my hand's a little too quick on switching screens. I apologize. <laughs> Types of compounding. Um, at Sunnybrook, we serve a variety of patients. Uh, some, of, some of our clinics include pain management, dermatology. Uh, we have lots of little babies born at Sunnybrook, so pediatrics, geriatrics, hormone replacement therapy, as well as sports medicine. Um, practice of compounding is used, utilized in many different reasons, and these are some of the most common ones. There are others as well, but uh, due to our patient population, these are some of the common ones that we uh, practice in. So I will start first with pain management. This is one area that um, th there are many people out there who are living with chronic pain, uh, as you're all aware. Although there are many pain relievers out there that are commercially available, um, we're all familiar with narcotics. Well, you know, narcotics come with lots of side effects, um, which is an, the reason why we look for better solutions. And compounding has made it possible for our patients. Um, we tailor medications to their needs, such as specialty pain creams, um, gels, sprays, capsules um, in a variety of different strengths. So depending on the need, uh, we would make, I, I just added a couple of pictures just to show you pain for pain. There aren't just tablets and capsules to swallow. There are other alternatives that our patients can get. And so um, that's what Sunnybrook does. Um, the next one is dermatology. Um, as you all aware, uh, we suffer from skin problems um, as we age. So some of, the re some of the issues people come up with are rosacea, acne, eczema, 
um, in variety of um, different patients in all ages, psoriasis, and other aging concerns that people have, for example, wrinkles. So um, many over-the-counter skincare items that are available um, are just known to cause too many skin irritations like itchiness, dryness, your skin peels, redness. Um, who would want that, right? So um, your pharmacy here at Sunnybrook uh, can tailor medications based on your, um, so we select specific ingredients so to treat uh, based on your skin type. So your dermatologist would recommend because they've seen the patient and then we would uh, manufacture with particular bases and their varieties out there because everybody's skin is different. So we make acne prone skin treatments, uh, peels, skin lightening creams, variety of medications out there that we uh, are able to make. <clears throat> My next, um, topic is pediatrics. Well, um, you may have seen this at home or you may have heard it from a friend because that your, your child is refusing to take the medication because it doesn't taste good or just some doses are not even available. Um, the, you know, there are premature babies out there that doses are not available. So they, we have to manufacture them. Um, another child is allergic to a particular dye or the, or the smell or could be many different reasons or they just don't like swallowing or, you know, certain medications not available in liquid. So we would, they, they can't swallow the capsule or the tablet, just like adults. So to compensate for that, um, obviously every parent wants their child to get, take medication, you know, without having to fight with them, as well as you want to make sure the medication is effective. So at Sunnybrook, we make all kinds of suspensions. We, we would add flavoring. We make troches. Um, they look sort of like little lozenges that can just dissolve in your mouth. So they don't even need to swallow. They might, you know, look or taste like candy. Um, as well as suppositories. Um, some children cannot just, um, you know, swallow medication and keep it down. You know, they could be nausea issues. So for those reasons, there's uh, suppositories available. So that is another um, area we can look, we also work in. Um, here are some examples. I have a little, little boy, a parent is trying to give a, a flavored medication, which makes a parent's life easy. Um, an example of a suppository mold, um, just if anyone cares to know how we make them. So we have molds for all kinds of things. And this is an example of suppositories. Mm -hmm. And then here's an example of um, red color troches, um, another you, sort of like a lozenge. And then on the top, I have a picture of um, some of the flavoring that we add that would make the medication slightly sweeter. So it doesn't obviously taste as bad. So it's easy to give it to your child. Um, uh, Jeff for geriatrics, um, I've added a little clip here. It says, we combine all your medications into one convenient dose. Funny enough, um, it's not a very convenient looking dose. It's a huge capsule for a poor fella who doesn't look very happy there. Um, so my parents at home um, have always complained, you know, this pill is too big. My mother-in-law always complains. I get gas when I take this medication. That's why I don't want to take it. And I don't wanna take so many pills. I get it, I understand it. So um, having these issues right at home, um, I completely understand, you know, there are ways to come around some of these issues. So um, Sunnybrook uh, makes many different uh, lower dose capsules to make up the strengths. E or if the strength is too high, you would make lower dose so they can swallow, you know, one capsule at a time, or you would combine multiple different medications into one preparation so that it's easy to swallow. Um, compounding has addressed all these concerns. Let's, uh, my next uh, slide here shows some pictures. Uh, the very first one is, um, hopefully everybody is able to see, it's a capsule maker um, that we have. And right beside it, we have pictures of all kinds of different capsules. So, you know, if one is too big, we can make it in small sizes. And then, of course, compounding for um, geriatrics, lots of creams and gels and sprays that we make, which makes their life a lot easy. I have another uh, picture of a mold on the very bottom. This is a, a suppository. Again, these also come in certain couple of different sizes. So this is another one that um, for small size patients as well, we look at. 
Um, the next, next topic is hormone replacement therapy. So um, hormones play a huge role in our overall health. As we age, our hormone levels uh, increase, decrease, they fluctuate. Um, as a result, um, these changes in hormones cause a lot of symptoms, including mood changes, weight gain or loss, um, even as something as simple as hair loss in men and women, um, which now compounding allows each patient um, to receive a treatment that is completely customized to their needs. So uh, for, the, for all the, the, some of the reasons I mentioned, and plus many more, we make all kinds of creams, gels, um, suppositories, hair loss solutions, medications are available in injection form, and much more. So depending on the patient's needs, that's how we would work. Uh, the next very common area we work in is uh, sports medicine. Um, sports injuries often occur in both um, athletes that are pro seasoned athletes, as well as new exercise um, uh, clients. They're faced with problems such as inflammation, muscle spasm, uh, fungal infections, hemorrhoids, as well as um, excessive um, perspiration. So um, our compounding solutions also provide um, us the ability to alter and deliver the medication depending on what the patient's needs are. Obviously, these are all prescriptions prescribed by their physicians here at Sunnybrook. As, and as I, I noted, some of the um, examples include creams, gels, sprays. These are some of the very common uh, forms that we dispense medication in. Um, Quality assurance, this is one area of um, pharmacy practice that we take very seriously. It is a, ultimately, it is a responsibility of the pharmacy manager um, and therefore the, the department manager in the hospital, um, in the pharmacy to follow all standards. Um, but it is also other um, pharmacy professionals who work with the pharmacy, so therefore technicians who also help alongside day to day to make sure we follow all standards of practice as well as stay up to date in terms of uh, what we do every day. So, you know, staff has to be fully trained, appropriate facilities, equipment, references, up-to-date references are always available on hand. Master formulas that we follow, we don't just make up our own, you know, um, um, procedures. We follow everything to standard, uh, used by dates. Um, all the equipment is certified periodically um, and, mostly uh, triple checks for every single medication that we make are performed on a daily basis. So um, these are some of the keys that I wanted to highlight to you. We follow a quality assurance program um, to make sure our final product um, is to the utmost, utmost quality where it should be, as well as protection of the staff who's, uh, who's preparing the medication. Um, well, this brings me to the end of my presentation. So I wanna say thank you. But before I leave tonight, I like to leave you um, with this little uh, picture. And I'm, um, I wanna see if anyone has any guesses. Um, oh, I think I was too quick. So the, yes, they are called rectal rockets. Um, this is just another route of medication delivery. So there are suppositories out there as well as rectal rockets. Now, this is an example of a mold for these rectal rockets that we make. So uh, difference between the suppository and rectal rockets is suppositories ins inserted all the way in. However, rectal rockets uh, insert medication inside as well as it covers, it, um, it makes sure this, this end right here stays where it's supposed to and also protects the area outside and heals the area outside as well. Anyway, th this brings me to the end. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I have given some insight as into what we do at Sunnybrook. Um, you know, as uh, we, we will mention it again, feel free to contact your pharmacist um, and Karen in our outpatient pharmacy is excellent at explaining what we do. And if I've missed out on any, on any information, please feel free to ask. We'll be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harjeet. It, compounding is, what you've told us is the peak of what we can actually do in compounding. So it's an awesome introduction. Thank you very much for that. This is a reminder to everyone watching at home, please send us your questions. And uh, if you have one, we'd like to answer them as much as possible. 
Now I have the pleasure of introducing our final speaker this evening. Jennifer Antunes is a registered pharmacy technician who works in the nephrology program at Sunnybrook. Her presentation focuses, uh, focuses on communicating with your pharmacy team, whether it be pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, pharmacy assistants, or even pharmacy students. Jennifer, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Antunis. I'm a pharmacy technician, uh, like Karen said. Um, I'm here to tell you the importance of keeping your pharmacy team in the know. Give me one second to share my screen, which I Not sure. Give me one second. Okay, can we see the screen? Let me just change the display. Okay, there we go. Uh, so once again, my name is Jennifer Antunis. Uh, we are, I'm gonna be talking about the importance of keeping your pharmacy team in the know. Um, so everyone here is part of your pharmacy team. Myself and Harjeet, we're both pharmacy technicians. Um, Karen is a pharmacist and Sarah is a pharmacy student who is working to become a pharmacist. So let's first talk about who works at your pharmacy. So we have the pharmacist and their duties. Their duties include providing information and education to patients, dispensing and selling, selling and compounding drugs, provide products for smoking cessation. So if you are a smoker and you decide that you want to quit, you can actually speak to your pharmacist to help you do that. Um, extending and adapting a prescription. What that means is if you have a prescription from a physician for an ear infection and the pharmacist is looking at it and they're usually for a child um, if they see well this is actually the doctor put a lower dose the pharmacist can actually adapt it and speak to the farm and speak to the physician and get it to the proper dose and even if like your blood pressure meds if you are no longer no longer have anything available the pharmacist can extend some until you speak to the doctor or until you uh, get a, a follow-up with the doctor um, so they can renew your prescription for you and administer vaccines. Then there's a pharmacy technician. Myself and Harjeet, we're both pharmacy technicians. We can provide non-clinical information and education. So this is like using an, how to use an inhaler or a device between the inhaler in case you have trouble of pushing down an inhaler and breathing in, um, using a blood glucose monitor, things like that. We can also dispense, sell, and compound drugs that have been therapeutically checked with the pharmacist. So what that means is we learned how to do, like dispense a medication and make sure that we're providing the proper medication. However, we never got into the, the area of the therapeutics where you leave that to the pharmacist. So what they do is they go through the profile and make sure what was prescribed for you is safe and effective. And then if the pharmacist says, yes, it is safe and effective for this patient, you can go on. Uh, so the pharmacist technician can actually dispense it to you. And we, we can also administer COVID and flu vaccines. Um, this is actually new to our uh, scope of practice. The COVID vaccine was initially um, it started as a help, like we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So we started, like we started vaccinating last year at around this time um, that the Ontario government said that yes, like pharmacy technicians, if you take the course, you can help vaccinate Ontario. Um, and after they realized how instrumental we are, um, they actually made it part of our scope of practice, which is new this year. So there's a couple of other people that will be at your pharmacy besides those two. There is the pharmacy student and the pharmacy technician student. They can provide care and service according to their scope of practice. So the pharmacy technician student will have a lot less than the pharmacy student, but they do work under, a like under the supervision of a pharmacist or technician when they're completing the tasks. So they make sure like 
the, the actual registered person will make sure that they are providing the right information and they are acting within their scope of practice. There are also pharmacy assistants. Uh, these are people who are unlicensed and unregulated. Uh, they help with the assigned pharmacy tasks like filling, preparing medications, um, cashing you out at the pharmacy, that sort of thing. There are a couple of different types of pharmacies. So there are the community pharmacies, which are your Shoppers Drug Mart, your Rexall, your independent pharmacy. And then there's the inpatient pharmacy hospitals, sorry, inpatient hospital pharmacies. Um, and there are, so currently in Ontario, um, there are 4,782 licensed pharmacies in the community. So those are your Shoppers Drug Marts. 237 inpatient hospital pharmacies. So this is like our outpatient pharmacy, um, our inpatient pharmacy at Sunnybrook, and there are other types of licensed pharmacies. So there's a total of 5,200, sorry, 5,025 licensed pharmacy practices, practice sites in Ontario. So there's a lot of availability and you can speak to a lot of pharmacists in many different aspects. Okay, so let's talk about the services available at your pharmacy. So there's vaccinations. So your pharmacist, any pharmacy technician, students, they can give you the COVID, they can give you the COVID and the flu shot. Stuff like hepatitis and shingles will be through the pharmacist and not the technician. They help you personalize medication packaging for adherence. So these are your compliance packages, so a blister pack. So if you have, if you're on 12 medications and you don't know what you take in the morning, you don't know what you take at night, and you want to make sure that you're not taking it inappropriately, the pharmacist can actually help you sort that together. They can help you dispose of medications and needles. The needles would be stuff like your insulin needles. Um, they give you one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one health education, um, consultations during life-changing events, and they do medication reviews. So let's meet Alex. Alex is a 55-year-old woman who has been diagnosed with multiple illnesses. She gets her prescriptions from the following, a cardiologist for her heart medications, an endocrinologist for her diabetes medications, a chiropodist for her feet medications, a nurse practitioner for pain medications from recent sports injury and sleep medication for insomnia. Also, Alex gets the following, health products from her health food store, recommended by her naturopath, supplements from her neighbor to help her with her weight loss journey. Alex's prescribers are not located near home. She often gets her medications filled at, a, at different pharmacies for convenience while going to her local pharmacy, the one closer to her house, for only her pain and sleep medications. So she has a bunch of different doctors throughout the city and depending on where she is, she's gonna get her medications from that pharmacy. So that is one, two, three, about four different pharmacies. At a recent visit to her home pharmacy, Alex saw that she, there was a service offered in Ontario for residents with three or more medications called a meds check and inquired with the pharmacy team. So a pharmacy te technician sits down with Alex and takes down the best possible medication history. So they review all the information they possibly can find um, by calling other pharmacies, speaking to Alex, um, grabbing the information from their own system, and they give it to the pharmacist to review with Alex. The pharmacist works with Alex to optimize her medications, including what to stop, what may need to be reviewed by a prescriber, and how to take certain medications to, minimize, to maximize benefits. They also agreed to transfer all the medications to this pharmacy so the pharmacist and Alex could work on work together to optimize her med medication regimen. The pharmacist also books a phone follow-up with Alex for a few weeks after their appointment. So what the problem it's well, the problem here is polypharmacy. So we know that Alex is going to multiple different pharmacies. Um, and is it a problem? Yes. But is it a deadly problem? Not always. So what is polypharmacy? When a patient seeks care for medical 
for multiple pharmacies for the same or different ailments. So if I have a stomach issue, one day I can go to one pharmacy and then another day I can have go to another pharmacy. We don't know what's gonna be prescribed because there are two different doctors, two different pharmacies. They can actually be the, the similar medication, just a different name and I wouldn't know. And I'm just gonna continue taking the same, the two medications that do the exact same thing. Can this be harmful to you? It's an increased risk of drug interactions and the use of excessive and or unnecessary medications, like two medications for your stomach. Um, who is at higher risk? Elderly patients, patients with multiple comorbidities, and patients who have recently been admitted to the hospital. So it's easy to happen. Uh, there are pharmacies in every, every area of the city. By my house, I can count just off the top of my head, I think there are three, maybe four pharmacies that I can walk to. So is polypharmacy a bad thing? No, what is important is to be as transparent as possible to the pharmacist and the pharmacy team so they can help you manage your care in a safe way. And that brings us to the circle of care where the patient is in the middle, the doctors, pharmacists, and physiotherapy, everything. They're all around the patient, it helps the patient, and there are other people around that to help the patient. And that's what we're really striving on. We wanna make sure that the patients are safe and they get the care that they need. And that's it. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That concludes our formal presentation. And we'll now begin the question and answer portion of the evening. If you still have a question that you haven't had a chance to submit, or perhaps there were questions that came after Jennifer's presentation, please feel free to type it into the web page and uh, our, our team will relay that question to me and we'll present it and have it answered for you. All right, so one of the interesting questions that I, I think is interesting because we all talk about having to pay for things, right? <laughs> nothing's ever truly free. So the question that was posed is, are compounded medications more expensive? I'm gonna let Harjeet answer that and then maybe I'll tag on a couple more comments after. Would that be okay, Harjeet? Yeah. Okay, so um, mainly the cost of the medication is same um, as it would be commercially available. However, because the pharmacy is uh, spending the time and, it, and the supplies it's, and the labor charge, all of that is considered like a compounding charge and which is all that's added, which is extra. So um, normally when you go to the, your pharmacy, you pay a dispensing fee. So um, pharmacies counting tablets, you know, preparing label or, you know, getting cream ready for you or whatnot. But in this case, we're actually making, the manufacturing the cream for you. So the manufacturing cost, so to speak, the compounding charge is all that's added extra. I hope that answers. It does. And I think there's a lot of additional information to add on to that as well. When we do compounding, compounding is sometimes about making something that's not available already. So it's hard to compare the cost of compounding to something that's potentially already manufactured, unless you're trying to mimic that, that medication because it's not available. So it's a hard question to answer whether it's more expensive or less expensive. It really depends. Typically, if you're comparing a tablet to another tablet, if you have to make the tablet, obviously it costs more for a human to make that tablet or a capsule versus a machine that can pump out you know, 10,000 capsules within an hour. So it does cost more because of more time, but it is more customized as well. So obviously it's, it's more catered to you and what you need. So it's a, it's a not a simple yes. <laughs> All right, uh, since we're on Harjeet with, with the question, there's a question about what medication would be used for a rectal rocket. Maybe you can tell us about the most recent rectal rocket you made and what was in that? We, I had one patient, uh, it's been a while though since I last made them, but um, that patient was getting them for hemorrhoids. Um, and it's used also for like anal fissures, uh, from what I understand. That's one of the main 
common reasons that I've made them for. But um, you're a pharmacist, maybe you can extrapolate on that a little more. <laughs> That's probably what I would have answered as well. So yeah. in the pharmacy world, it's, it's about treating the internal and external rectum area, so anus and rectum. So if you need the medication inside and out, it's much easier to use the rectal rocket than to have a external cream and an internal suppository. So that's where that convenience factor comes into play as well. And because of the shape of that rectal rocket, the external, the, the part that kind of stops right where the anus is, so where the opening is, it dissolves in that area so that you don't have to actually apply ointment to that area. So that's where the rectal rocket would be used for. There could be other reasons why rectal rocket may be used, but usually with uh, you know, anal fissures or with hemorrhoids, that's where we see them the most, right? There's a question about, a I think there's a, there's a question that was sent earlier about having tablets that you need to split. And the question lists about a five milligram tablet that this patient needs to split in half and the doctor only wanted the, this patient to take half a tablet a day. And will the efficacy of this drug be affected in the long run? This kind of dabbles in compounding, but not quite. So I'm gonna answer this from a pharmacist's perspective, if you guys don't mind, our panelist doesn't mind. It, it depends. And I know everyone hates that answer, but it depends. It depends on what kind of pill it is and what kind of release mechanism it has. So a regular tablet that you can crush, chew, doesn't matter. Splitting it in half doesn't matter as much. But if a medication is a slow release capsule or a tablet, then it does matter. If you split it in half, there's a potential for all of the medication to be released all at once. And so there is danger in that. And certain medications can only be taken in a slow release form and could be very, very hard on the body when taken all at once. So it's best to ask your pharmacist to see if that pill can be split. If that pill cannot be split, but you need something in a smaller dose, then either the pharmacist can work with the physician and figure out something uh, that we can use in between, or just change it to a different drug altogether. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, there's a question here also about vaccines. And if a person has a known allergy to eggs, can one be vaccinated against the flu shot? Oh, well, I guess it's the flu, I'll get the flu virus. Uh, sorry, let me reword that. <laughs> Can the person get the flu vaccine, which is cultured in eggs? Sarah, I, I know the vaccination presentation didn't really touch on allergies for egg, of eggs or two eggs. Can you maybe comment a little bit on that? And I can also add a little bit if you would like. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what I've learned from school, uh, we were we were taught that uh, people with egg allergies um, are um, still recommended to get flu vaccines. Um, I think egg allergies can range. So if they have mild egg allergies, such as like hives, they're still they're recommended to get flu vaccines. If they have more serious um, side effects, um, then that's the point where they should be closely monitored after vaccination. Um, just like that 15 to 30 minutes that I um, recalled from my presentation um, and having uh, that epinephrine ready just in case they do have a serious allergic reaction. Thank you. And the, the guidelines as of I think last year actually recommended for those with egg allergies to still continue to get the flu vaccine. If you have a very severe egg allergy, then you can let the pharmacy know there are actually vaccines that are not made in the, in an egg. So there are actually those who, you still get the flu shot, you just have to know which one. Very good. It's a good question. Uh, maybe Harjeet or Jennifer or even Sarah can answer this. Can the pharmacist or the pharmacy team split the pill better than at home with a knife? Okay, so I'll answer this one, um, being community. So the pharmacy can split your tablets ahead of time for you. However, what I like, what we've noticed is when they're in the bottle, they get shaken up. So they start to crumble. Um, so you might not actually get the full dose. 
So splitting that one tablet at home can actually be more beneficial. Now, there are tablets that are scored. So there's like a, it's like a circle and there's a line in the middle and it's made, it manufactured in a way that you push two sides down and it'll split right in the middle and it should be an even split. Uh, some, there's also this very simple gadget that you can actually place a tablet inside and close and it'll cut the tablet in half for you. So you take one tablet one day and like one half of the tablet one day and one half the other day. That's what I recommend for patients as well, but there are those who are not able to split tablets at home altogether just because of dexterity, no matter how frail they are or how, sorry, how, uh, how their hands are able to function and pop that tablet open or pop the capsule open or pop that tablet in half then it's, it's easier for the pharmacy to just cut them in half. And what we usually do is to put a piece of gauze in there so that the rattling doesn't happen as, as much. But Jennifer is, is right. A lot of times we would suggest for you to cut them in half at home. And if you can't, let us know so that we can actually cut them in half for you. This is a really good question that I have a lot of folks ask as well is, are all conversations with the pharmacy team privacy protected? And the short answer is yes. The longer answer is it depends because everything that you say to us is privacy protected because it is, it is part of the Privacy Act, the Health Health Information Act. So we do have to keep it private. There are certain situations where we do have to share. For example, if a police officer comes in with a warrant. Uh, so like I said, it depends, but those are kind of extreme. So. If you will have a conversation, for example, if you come to the M1 pharmacy and have a conversation with me, I will not go and divulge it to the next patient and say, oh, so-and-so came in and just told me that. So that conversation is private. However, if you need us to share information with your prescriber, for example, that is still within your circle of care. Unless you let us know that I don't want to share this information with anyone at all, then we will also keep that in mind and also keep that in your profile as well. I'm trying to get through these questions as well. I can hear. Hmm. Well, this is an interesting question. The question is, what's the most commonly prescribed drug? I'm going to I'm going to pull the audience on this one. So, I'm going to I'm going to ask Sarah because she's newest to the profession. So, Sarah, what's the most commonly prescribed drug that you've seen so far in working with us at the pharmacy? Um, the most um I would say like metformin. <laughs> I see quite a bit <laughs> at the pharmacy. For, for those who don't know, metformin is usually the first drug that first drug of choice for treating diabetes or pre-diabetes. Arjit, what's the most common commonly prescribed drug that you've seen? In our pharmacy, we compound um, a lot of oral medications, and one of the most common one that we make very regularly is uh, pentoprazole. So um, I'll give you a little. Uh, this actually goes back to the question about can a patient split pills at home safely? Well, this particular medication is not scored. So you're not able to cut it at home. And it also, even if you try to cut it, you won't be able to cut it straight because it has a coating on it. So this particular coating um, will just kind of break apart if you attempt to do this at home. So what we do is we crush the tablet. We literally have to stir um, as, as we make it, we, we stir it for like over half an hour in order for the tablet and the coating on the tablet to dissolve. So um, this is one of the common ones that we use a lot in inpatient. Um, from the outpatient, it's a lot of um, pain creams. Um, and going back to my presentation, a lot of different varieties of pain medication, but in cream or gel form. Those are the most common. Hey, Jennifer, what's the most commonly prescribed drug that you've seen? 
So before I would have said metformin, but now that I've been in pharmacy for a while, and now that I work in a nephrology unit, I would say the most prescribed drugs, there's actually two. One is acetaminophen, so Tylenol, and the other one is a stool softener, any stool softener. I'm saying the group of stool softeners or, yeah. So those are the most prescribed. Well, thank you. I think most prescribed for me changes from year to year. And it really depends on the practice. So at an outpatient pharmacy where we deal with a lot of discharge medications, we do deal with a lot of pain medications. So for example, acetaminophen, stool softeners, because of the pain medication that may cause constipation like hydromorphone or morphine. And sometimes there's an anti-inflammatory in there. So it's for us, the most commonly prescribed drug is very different than the pharmacy down the street. So it, de it depends. I, I know, like I said, no one likes to answer, but it depends. The next question, generic medications are, are cheaper. So what about the quality, the quality of the generic drug? Uh, I'll take this one just because I don't know if the, our panelists today have dove into this much in the past. But it, the generic drugs, think of it this way, and I, like, I love to use analogies, but think of it this way. If I'm going to pick on Jennifer because she's beside me in the screen. So if Jennifer does homework and she does all the research. She went to the library, spent five hours there every day doing this research paper. And then one day I sit beside her and I copied her. Word for word, I copied her. That's kind of what generics do. So Jennifer did all the research. So a, a big company may do all the initial research and development of a new drug. And that's what we call quote unquote brand name because they came up with it first and they have a patent and whatnot. Generic medications are like me. I sit beside Jennifer and I go and copy that formula. I don't necessarily need to do a lot of research and development because it's already done. But I do have to make sure that my formula is equal to hers because if it's not then health canada is not going to deem it as equivalent so there is some research but not as much as what the brand name company would would make and so they're cheaper because of multiple things one they don't have to invest as in as much i'm not saying none but not as much uh, r d or research and development uh, and quality wise it depends on the medication a lot of times it's equal. So Health Canada will deem them equivalent and that we can interchange them as pharmacies without any issues. We will also let you know that we've changed it over and you do ultimately as patients have a choice. So the question is, is, is it worse? No, it's not worse. It's just pretty much a copy of, it's like a photocopy of the brand name. So think of it that way. And there are certain medications that it does make a difference in terms of brand name versus generic. And I think it's best to ask your pharmacist about that because sometimes the relief mechanism might be different in a brand name versus generic. If you have allergies to certain things and you find that the brand name works better for you and you don't get a reaction, then talk to your doctor and your pharmacist and they can, they can work that out as well. All right, we have a handful of other questions as well. So one, one of the questions is, do you recommend vitamins, vitamins and minerals? So between Harjit, Jennifer, and Sarah, how many pharmacies have you been to that don't sell vitamins or minerals? Every pharmacy I've gone to uh, or worked at and gone to has sold vitamins and minerals. Harjit, have you ever been to a pharmacy that doesn't sell them? No, <laughs> I agree with what Jennifer said. How about Sarah? Yeah, I haven't either. <laughs> so the question is, do I recommend them as a pharmacist? Yes, I do. And do I recommend every single vitamin and mineral out there? No. I just, I always caution patients as a pharmacist to make sure that you don't duplicate your vitamins. So sometimes you'll have a big bottle of a multivitamin, then you take you know, a calcium supplement, then you take a, a magnesium supplement, and then you have all these supplements, but not realizing that the, the calcium is also in your multivitamin. 
the magnesium is also in your multivitamin. And there is a recommendation to not have too much, uh, but if you do need to supplement, make sure that you do get tested and make sure that you do need that much supplement, uh, that many supplements. Hopefully that answers that question. There is a, I'm going to, I'm going to generalize this question. So the question is, do doctors know that certain medications are harder on certain patients than others? Yes. And sometimes no. But it depends. And that's why the team has to work together. So your pharmacist and your pharmacy team, whether it be your pharmacy, your pharmacist, a pharmacy technician, pharmacy student, it's so important to actually be honest and frank with what you're taking. Because if you don't tell them, they wouldn't know. And within Ontario, unfortunately, we're not connected to the point where Alberta and BC are, where you can actually access your med list from wherever you, you go. So the pharmacy in BC, from pharmacy one to pharmacy two, can actually see each other's billings and what you filled throughout the, the, the month. In Ontario, and that's one of the questions I usually get is, oh, there's an Odette Cancer Center pharmacy here. Aren't you linked? Unfortunately, even though we're in the same, we're, we're in the same, under the same roof, we're not linked. And I have no records of what you filled there, and they have no records of what you filled at M1 Pharmacy. And that's the, that's where we are depending on our patients to make sure that you are open with us to let us know what you're taking, what allergies do you have? And that we can, you know, call on Harjeet to make a compound for you, or we can get Jennifer to do a medication list for you so that you can, we can review it together or have Sarah come along and review your meds with us together. So that's where that's that important, important part is. So it's, oops, sorry. So it's, does a doctor know? Most likely yes. But is it good to double check? Yes. So that's where the pharmacy team comes into play. I can see if there's any other questions here. This is a good question for our panelists as well as myself, I guess. Does refrigeration of medication make a difference? And does refrigerated medication does refrigerated medication after expiry, is it, is it safer to have it in the fridge? And how long can a medication last after the expiry when you keep it in the fridge? So just as a personal story, uh, I'm pretty sure my mom's not here, so I can tell a story about her. <laughs> my, my mom loves to put medication in the fridge. And it's out of habit. We... we came from Hong Kong, it's hot and humid there. So she would always keep medication in the fridge. And it's, it's a very common thing that my mom does. And I told her, you don't have to keep it in the fridge. She's like, I just store it in there. I make it a habit to go to her fridge because that's her medication cabinet, right? So I like to, I like to go to her fridge every six months or so and clean it out because if it's, if it's expired, it really shouldn't be used. Jennifer, Harji, and Sarah. Do you guys have any experience with refrigerated medication? Uh, okay, so like you, uh, my parents came, my parents immigrated from another country. They came from Portugal, where it is hot and humid. You're right by the ocean. Um, so they put every liquid, every liquid medication needs to go into the fridge. So your Buckley's, your Benelin, any cough medicine goes into the fridge which I've, I never understood it as a child. I just thought it meant to be there um, until I actually went to school and I realized, no. Um, so for stuff like that, the cough syrups, um, the sugar actually crystallizes and it gets thicker, which could be a problem. Um, and it's meant to be stored in a room temperature. I hope you share that knowledge with your parents. <laughs> yes, they stopped. 
for be, well. being, a, being in compounding, does refrigerate, the refrigeration make a difference? Yes, absolutely it does. Um, compounding medication already um, because it's manufactured in an environment where a pharmacy, small pharmacy does not have you know, the environment of a big pharmaceutical company. So we already, as is, when we give a shorter expiry date on our compounds. And if it's a refrigerated item, it is definitely should be in the, in the fridge for as long as it says. And if it hasn't been used, um, first of all, it should only, the amount dispensed is generally for the time the patient is expected to take the medication. But if it hasn't been used in that time and it has expired based on the date on the label, it definitely should not be used. Yeah. That's, that's a good suggestion, a good recommendation for all our medications. If it's past the yeah. before use date, if it's expired, you really shouldn't use it. If it's an absolute emergency and you, you know, it's 3 a.m. and you really need a Tylenol and it's a month expired, there's a shoppers down the street that's open 24 hours. <laughs> I always say that there's an alternative and, you know, if you're really, really stuck, then you're stuck and it's an emergency situation. But if you can help it, and this actually is the next question, you know, your cabinet once in a while. And, you know, let me, let me ask our panelists, what do you do every time we switch the clock? What, what do you do? What do you also check? Anyone? Your smoke alarms, batteries. Very good, Harjeet. So <laughs> oh. that's also a good time to check your cabinet. So yeah. <laughs> every every six months or so, I say check your cabinet. If you are in the habit of checking your cabinet on a more regular basis, that's great. But usually that Tylenol or Advil bottle that you bought you know, three to six months ago, just still be in good dating. But, you know, the next time you check, it might have expired by then. So just keep in mind that those are the emergency medications you might need at home. Another one that you should check on a regular basis is your emergency stuff. So your EpiPen, your epinephrine pen, right? Those usually have about a year at most, maybe a year and two months. So uh, during September, when all the kids go back to school, that's usually when we actually dispense a lot of EpiPens because no one wants to use them. And typically if they're not used, they do end up expiring. So be, be aware of that. And, the second part of the question is, and you guys can all unmute yourselves because I know you all know the answer. Can you throw medication in the garbage? No. No. <laughs> uh, and what's the reason why? That's okay. I'll answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer it. But... <laughs> where, where does your garbage go? It goes into the landfill. I and mean, we don't want medication in the landfill. So yeah. a lot of times medications will end up in the landfill if you actually flush it down the toilet or, or ends up in the water system, right? So it's actually not safe because a lot of people may be, aller people may be allergic. And I know what the water system it does get cleaned and whatnot, but with the landfill especially, medication can dissolve and seep into our water system that way too. So the best way to throw out your, your medication that you don't need anymore is to put it in a bag and bring it to the pharmacy. And the pharmacy actually gets it incinerated and destroyed properly. The only thing that I would suggest for all of our patients watching tonight is to make sure that you separate your needle from your oral medications or your liquids. The reason why is because pharmacy staff members will just take that bag, whether there be needles in there or not, they'll take the bag, thank you very much for disposing it properly, and end up storing it into the medication waste when there's sharks and things that I could actually accidentally poke them. So just be aware of that and make sure that you do us pharmacy staff a favor to separate them and pills in one section and then sharps will probably get you to put into a sharps container. Does our compounding pharmacy compound eye drops? Arjit, do we make eye drops? Uh, as you've been answering all the questions, short answer, yes, we do. Um, at Sunnybrook, as well as um, doing all the non-sterile compounding that I thoroughly went in uh, through earlier, we also have, we also do sterile compounding. We have, um, I would say, a top-notch um, sterile room where we take care of all our inpatient medications. 
Uh, we manufacture their daily needs um, every single day. We do base specific patient medication orders as well as batching for the entire hospital. So it, within that room, uh, we always have one person assigned for any uh, eye drop orders that uh, Karen's and her staff's uh, calls us and said they need it right away, patients waiting. And as soon as we receive the fax order, we get on it. So yes, um, variety of different eye drops we make. Uh, some take, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes. Some can take 45 minutes. So their time is very important, but yes, short answer, yes, we do. Thanks, Harzi. We're actually coming to the end of our questions and I am grateful that everyone has submitted so many interesting questions and spark such discussion and hopefully some fun for our panelists as well. I want to conclude just before my conclusion were <laughs> my conclusion is to make sure that you guys as patients make sure that you are open and frank with your pharmacy team. Sometimes we ask not because we're nosy, we ask because we care. And so we want to make sure that we have all the information from you so that we can actually make an informed decision and help you be more informed about what medication you're getting and also the treatment that you're receiving. So thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists as well. We've come to the conclusion of our Q&A section and a few more points just before we wrap up. Please make sure to take a moment to fill out the electronic evaluation form. That will help us in planning future talks and topics for you. I'd also like to thank all our speakers for an incredibly informative evening. Thank you to Donna, Donna Duncan from Sunny Brooks Board of Sunny Brooks Board for providing our introductions and a big thanks to all of you for joining us for this discussion. Please be sure to check out our upcoming topics which will be shared on the speaker series website. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.